you ready? We're ready, thank you. Okay, as we always do, would you care to join us in a prayer first? Yeah. Um, Lord, as we meet in person tonight after such a long time apart, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the diligence of our administration, principals, teachers, and staff to work together and make decisions with everyone's best interest at heart. Thank you for our maintenance and custodial staff for all their hard work to get our buildings ready and clean for our students. We thank you for our students and their families. Be with them as they are learning how to navigate through our new normal. Please give us all patience through this time. We ask that you continue to watch over us and keep us safe and healthy. May our schools continue to be a safe place of learning and growth. Please be with us tonight as we conduct the business of our school district. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As we have all board members here, I'll call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is our public comments. Um, David, how are we going to work that tonight? Are folks calling in? Do we have an open phone line? So Mrs. Betts is here, and if anybody has a comment, they should go to fcscommunications at franklinschools.org. Mrs. Betts will retrieve that comment, and then she will share the person's name and the comment. All right. Um, Thank you, Mrs. She, Betts. So she is sitting out there. So, <laughs> And we can also, since tonight's in, in a relatively new format, we uh, she gets set up, and as people get used to it, we also have that second comment section. Yeah, absolutely. Just to allow them to come back and answer questions on the agenda um, that they may, they may not have a chance to get right now as opposed to what we normally do, if that's that, okay with everybody. That sounds good. So for those folks that are here tonight, do we have any comments regarding the agenda tonight? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the next item, is the consent agenda. Before I open this up, Dr. Klinden and, and you and your staff and all the principals, I just want to extend a huge thank you you guys have filled positions for our CARE Act uh, positions, teachers in a very short period of time, and, and it shows by the uh, personnel report that we have here tonight, but really want to say thank you for that hard work. Thanks to all the principals for organizing that and, and getting that done so the folks are here ready to go as we start the school year. So well done on that. Yeah, thank you. I'll pass that along. The principals have been just working extremely hard on hiring, also putting a safe school in place and everything. And I know, I think everybody is ready for next, next week. <laughs> and, uh, so, so that'd be good, but I will definitely pass that along. Um, just a couple other comments about the agenda tonight. We do have Mr. Doty here. And one of the things on the update of the reentry plan um, are the athletic uh, arrangements for the fall sports. Um, we have submitted those to Dr. Mormon. And so he is here to answer any questions, if anybody has any with regard to them. Um, but it really is a phase structure similar to what we have in place for, for the entire school. And as long as we go to phase five, we'll have 25% capacity at the fall sports. So in the stadium outside, uh, Bill will have tickets set up and arranged for that. Inside, it would actually be almost like a normal event, the volleyball and things like that. Would, would probably never get to 25%. Uh, so he will monitor that. If we stay in 4.5, it goes down to two tickets to moms and dads. He has already communicated with the athletic directors that we are participating against uh, to share that information. And then if for some reason it reverts back to four or three and we're still in school or we go to virtual, it would just be the student athletes participating and we would not have an attendance uh, procedure set up. It would just be kids going to play and participate. We also have purchased equipment for a live streaming feed, partnering with the IHSAA. And I know we're trying to get all that stuff in, and a few of the cameras, I believe, are still back ordered. Is that right, Mr. Doty? So that, that's, part of, that's part of this week's re-entry plan. Um, in addition, uh, we did have some changes to actually just updating the mask rule. And that is, uh, if you are in our building and someone is present, we want you to have the mask on. Um, unless you're in your room by yourself, you can take your mask off. And we're also just 
reminding everybody, please don't congregate. We know at lunch it's going to be a tough time and you want to see your friends and everything, but we also don't want to have anybody be impacted. Uh, a neighboring school actually had that where 11 people were quarantined for the first week of school because they went to lunch together. Mm. And we, we don't want that. And actually my, my YouTube announcement today talked about that. So we just want to remind everybody, mask on all the time unless nobody's present. Very good. Do we have any other questions or comments on the consent agenda? Uh, I want to make one more. Yeah. On H, on the handbook edition. This actually comes into play with regard to conversation we've been having with diversity and inclusion. And we wanted to just highlight that we are not allowing the Confederate flag on our property or in any building. Um, in the past, we've had situations where kids would, especially at the high school, put the Confederate flag in the back of the truck or whatever, and run it up and down, or they might be on a t-shirt. We just wanna make it a safe place for everybody. And so this edition, um, it's, it's a really very simple sentence will be highlighted and placed in all handbooks for our school. That's great. And then on item J, again, back to the personnel report, we've got two longtime Franklin teachers retiring, Ms. Scott, Mrs. Wagner. Um, both of those ladies have been with the schools for over 20 years. Uh, Mrs. Scott, almost 30 years. So again, we send our thank yous for their support, their time here with Franklin. We wish them all well in their next, uh, next endeavors. All right, any other comments or questions on the consent agenda? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Move for approval. Thank you. With that, um, Christy, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Thank you, Becky? And Ryan. Yes. And I vote yes, so the consent agenda passes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move down to the next item, which is the superintendent reports. Thank you. We have three tonight. First, I'd like to invite uh, our lead HR specialist to the stage, and, and Michelle Bright. There's been a lot of questions about what what are we supposed to do if I get sick or my child gets sick. And a few months ago, we did have Michelle in a virtual world go through a presentation that, that she set in with Ice Miller and received some excellent information from Tara Cisco. So today, I thought I'd bring her back and answer a few of those frequently asked questions so that you can hear them again, also so that we can record them for people. And I know that some of you have had people reach out to you and ask kind of what if questions. So I thought this would be a good time to yeah, infuse those into the conversation. So, Mrs. Bright. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Clendening asked me to, uh, to be here tonight to just kind of do a quick overview. Um, we went ahead and attached the original um, presentation from the May meeting, just so you had it in front of you, um, regarding the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which is really kind of two pieces. The first being the emergency paid sick leave which is kind of the first two weeks of leave, and then the um, emergency FMLA, which is an additional 10 weeks for the very specific purpose of, you know, childcare, daycare, schools being closed, things like that. So a lot of what we're gonna see is likely gonna fall under that emergency paid sick leave portion of things. And that allows up to 80 hours of paid time off for very specific things as it relates to COVID. Um, full-time employees get up to the 80 hours part-time employees um, their hours are paid based on a average of hours they've worked over the, the period of time before so for an employee who is subject to quarantine either federal state or local for an employee who has been advised by a health care um, professional to self-quarantine due to d concerns related to covid and then if the employee is um, him or herself experiencing symptoms of COVID and seeking a diagnosis, they're eligible for up to 100% of their pay for, for up to 80 hours or two weeks. Um, the law also allows for two thirds of pay for an individual who is caring for an individual who is suffering from COVID and or the son or daughter whose place of childcare may have closed or school. So 
it's either two thirds of your full pay or 100% depending on the reason. Um, and we do have forms. Um, I created a form and then Ice Miller ripped it apart and started, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but they really did take, Sounds right. um, uh, they, Tammy has been very helpful and she took the forms that we had created and really just tweaked them a little bit and added some language and made sure that they were appropriate. So we do have an approval form or an application, I suppose, for mm -hmm. the emergency paid sick leave and also from the, uh, for the emergency family medical leave portion of that as well. And so, um, in administering that, you know, just having those conversations with people and trying to help them navigate through if this is something that they're one, eligible for, and two, um, if it best suits their needs. So, um, we have also really worked towards, um, an opportunity for teachers especially and other staff members who are able to work from home to have the opportunity to do so even if they are quarantined and um, maybe even staying at home with a child who has been quarantined because we felt like that was probably the best opportunity for our students to continue to learn and get um, the valuable instruction that they would have gotten from their regular classroom teacher. So um, if we're in a situation where a teacher is quarantined but maybe not feeling ill. You know, we go through the contact tracing and um, identify some teachers who really shouldn't come to school. We are very likely gonna work with the, um, with the building principal and allow them to continue to teach virtually from home so that we can continue that instruction. We feel like that's best for students. And then obviously put somebody in the classroom, hopefully an assistant, maybe a substitute if we run out of people in the buildings to help um, really just in the classroom to maintain decorum um, make sure they're supervising, you know, there's somebody obviously physically present in the classroom to supervise, and then also to assist that teacher maybe in ways that she can't in the classroom, um, you know, just asking for help if the kiddos need to obviously take a restroom break or, you know, move between classes and things like that. So hopefully allowing the, some of those teachers to have the opportunity to continue their instruction, not use emergency paid sick leave while they're doing it, and thus be able to save that for a later date in case they really do become very ill and are unable to work. Um, because that bucket of 80, 80 hours is a one and done type of situation. So um, we wanna give them as much opportunity to continue working as we possibly can in those types of situations. Um, so Amanda, and just another update, Amanda Martin, Jeff Sewell, uh, Matt Sprout and Robin Betts and I have been working very closely over the past week or so to develop some tools that our teachers and students can use when they have a positive case. So we want them to be able to self-report um, when they have a positive test case so that Amanda can then um, start down the path of contact tracing and making sure that if we've had close contact within the buildings that we're immediately addressing that and um, talking to teachers, other staff members, and students in the classroom who might have been affected and kind of going down the, the quarantine path from there. So there's gonna be a form, it's gonna be on the website, and it's going to be emailed out to all of our staff members so that they have access to report positive cases. Um, we're still asking they communicate with me if they have questions. I'm getting a lot of questions. Um, you know, while I was with um, I was at a wedding over the weekend and somebody was positive. And so some of those questions, because it's very specific and the details for the CDC guidelines, Amanda and I are working very closely together on identifying what that means for that particular person. And every case is very, very um, specific and very general, you know, very um, case by case basis for, for really everything. They're all very different. So um, those are just kind of the, the, the basic updates. I don't know if anybody has specific questions I can help maybe answer. No, not a specific one, but just a reminder, if you would, if you would put the material out on board docs for us, um, there, there's no information out on board docs if you were going to share for the minutes. So you can attach that uh, presentation there. I'm having trouble N hearing. Natalie's shaking her head yes. Yeah, Natalie's shaking her head yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding what That's you're okay. asking. The, this this inf this presentation is attached to the agenda. Yeah, it's not on the agenda. Oh, okay. So oh, okay. Just want to make sure it gets perfect. There. Um, also, the the law itself, um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, we they, we they actually provided us with posters 
and the posters are posted in multiple places throughout the buildings where people tend to go break rooms, work rooms, things like that, so that people should be able, they're, they're right next to our you know, equal opportunity posters and things like that, so they're all centrally kind of located too. Great. The other clear definition for our school is that Michelle is the only person answering questions That's on this, right. from both certified and non-certified. We didn't want to muddy the water and have people talking to two different people, so Michelle is our lead, so she's taking all of the questions, and then on contact tracing, it goes to Amanda, but then ultimately it comes back to Michelle, dealing with the adults in our ward. So um, we want to make sure everybody's clear on that, that if they have any questions at all, Michelle Bright is the person that is going to speak for us in this area. And as the, uh, you know, as CDC guidelines and things like that continue to change, we'll stay in consultation with Amanda to make sure that I'm providing the best um, information for all of those very unique situations because every situation has been very different. Mm -hmm. Does this plan go into effect if we go full virtual or is that a whole different? So the, the actual law went into effect April 1. So it was a little bit, we, we didn't really use it a lot then because we weren't in the buildings. So um, the law basically says if you are unable to work or and unable to work from home. So they're eligible for emergency paid sick leave if we cannot accommodate the ability to work from home in some way. So if we were to go fully virtual, the teacher, the teaching side of life would, would, would be less impacted very likely. Um, because they would have the ability to do that, especially with students not in the buildings. Everybody would be at home virtual. Um, more of an impact we're still going to see with custodians, um, food service workers, the folks that we have a harder time saying you have the ability to, mm -hmm. to work from home. Great information. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I see you wore your you wore your Purdue mask for Mr. Lamb. That's very nice. Yeah, of we you. appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and it matched my shirt. <laughs> okay. Next item is our update on summer projects. Good evening. So as I sat down to think about uh, the things I wanted to share with you today, I kind of realized that typically this time of year I'd be giving you a rather mundane report of the capital projects that we've done, like fi fixing some pavement somewhere, repairing some walls, a roof, whatever it is. And I can certainly report on some of that. We, uh, <laughs> we did make some big improvements to uh, the web yeah, HVAC system. Uh, we did some maintenance and repairs to Union Septic Field. We did repair a bunch of walls. We did repair a bunch of pavement. But uh, what I'd really like to highlight for you is some of the other things that we've done uh, this uh, very unique summer uh, in all of our different uh, operations teams. So um, I think without a doubt, one of the ones that started for us the earliest as we closed schools and we started feeding folks is our, our food services team really uh, came together for us and started preparing uh, uh, meals uh, for our community. And I stand here to today to tell you, uh, we have uh, delivered uh, 125,532 meals wow. uh, since we closed school. Wow. Uh, and that is just from food services. Our Cub uh, Pantry program, I don't have a count on that, but many, many meals uh, distributed through that program as well. And so uh, I want to commend uh, Jill Overton and her entire team who have staffed that faithfully uh, to our school resource officers, uh, Doug Cox and Nathan Wooten, who have staffed that faithfully, um, Bill Doty and uh, Coach Call, uh, so many others that were there for us week after week, volunteering, sacking hundreds and thousands of, of, of cartons of milk and, and meals and uh, just a great way to impact the, the community. So uh, I really, uh, if you have an opportunity to thank Jill and her team and, and the, the, the uh, volunteers that helped us, that was a great, uh, a great uh, program this year. What was that number again? 125,532 wow. meals as of last week. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we have one more of those tomorrow. And then uh, Jill has also been hard at work uh, preparing for what uh, 
meals look like in, in, a, in a COVID era. So the meals will be prepackaged and, and delivered under sanitary conditions. Uh, she's uh, acquired a meal magic reservation program that allow us to have kind of an, a touchless meal payment and reservation uh, process. And uh, she's also working to make sure we, we continue to provide meals to those uh, families that have chosen a virtual uh, option in their in their uh, journey forward with us. So, and then if we trans transition to at-home learning, she's got a plan for sustaining uh, our, our feeding programs, uh, even in those circumstances. So, so Jill and her team, again, I can't uh, say enough about them. Uh, Doug Dickinson and our transportation team has also been been hard at work as we as we tasked him with figuring out what does busing look like at two-thirds capacity of a bus. And we asked him, uh, I threw him so many curveballs, he didn't know which way to, to swing <laughs> this, year, this year, I'll tell you. Uh, so he took those in stride. He's done a great job. We asked him to uh, look at walk zones for us. We asked him to look at two-tiered routing. We asked him, what is it going to take for us to get students to, to school on time? And I think with the community helping us out, we have many families reporting they plan to take kids to school for us. Uh, he, he has a, a good plan that, that we're confident will uh, get our, our kids to school safely. And so to Doug and his, his team uh, who helped uh, get the buses through inspection and get a sanitizing process in place, all of that. Uh, they also, one of our capital projects was they replaced the bus lifts in the transportation uh, center that were uh, showing signs of wear and needed to be replaced for safety reasons. So they've had a big summer. And so again, an, another group uh, to, to uh, tip our hats to. Custodial services team also been very busy. Uh, obviously, as we looked at what is uh, a, a socially distanced classroom look like that entailed moving desks around and figuring out what's the optimal configuration, moving lots of furniture out, uh, helping teachers and uh, administrators kind of uh, see the room through the eyes of a custodian who's got to clean and sanitize. And then uh, th they've been just awesome at uh, figuring out those processes, getting our checklists up to date and ready to go. So as we hit the first days of school, uh, we're, we're ready with a, a clear process on that. that. That also allows me to highlight a, a point of uh, teamwork and cooperation between transportation and our custodial team. Uh, since we aren't taking as many trips this year, we'll have bus drivers who have hours in their schedule uh, th that they can help our custodial teams with some of those sanitizing tasks. So. Uh, Doug and his team have been very open and positive about that, and and we uh, we, we just spoke again today about how to manage that, and so uh, that uh, is very very good uh, stuff going forward. Our grounds and maintenance guys uh, they helped lock our buildings while the buildings were closed and keep things operating and safe, and make sure uh, we didn't have water leaks and make sure HVAC systems were running and, and staying in a safe condition, ready to go when we called called upon them and, and started operating them, them at kind of full tilt, but they kept them, them up and running at kind of uh, a good maintenance levels. Uh, they also, we had them down to just one day, you know, one person one day a week for a long time. And so there was a lot of maintenance that had to be caught up on. Our, our grass got kind of tall and our landscaping kind of uh, scraggly. But I tell you, if you go around the corporation now, everything looks really nice. They've done a great job getting that caught up. Uh, 450 san hand sanitizers, <laughs> those have been installed. That's a lot, they, they've done that for us. They've moved lots and lots and lots of furniture. And uh, again, uh, one of our projects we're, we're uh, working on right now is uh, monitoring our HVAC systems and the fresh air that we're bringing in, kind of getting ready to, to be ready to, to monitor that in real time and, and uh, take care of that as a benchmark. So uh, again, I couldn't be prouder to have a great team, uh, you know, not only our admin team, but everybody across the board. Uh, too many examples, and I'm sure I've, I've forgotten something significant somebody did, and if I did, I apologize for that, because we we did have a lot of all hands on deck uh, moment and a lot of just great um, uh, innovation and teamwork uh, this summer, and so I, I stand before you proud to, to give that, that report. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. What has been the impact to the custodians on the additional cleaning? How much more time is that driven into the process? Well, we have uh, we've tackled that in a couple different ways. So 
we are deferring or reducing the frequency of some of the, the routine cleaning that they you would normally that, do. Yep. So uh, instead of maybe uh, vacuuming the entire room, they would like triage that and hit it, hit the spots that, that need it, uh, but then do a thorough vacuuming once a week or the chalkboards might get it once a week instead of daily and some of the other things. So they've, they've boiled it down to the basics of what has to actually do be done. The trash has to go out, the bathrooms have to be cleaned, the sanitizing has to be done. Those are the, like the top nightly chores. During the day, we're gonna make sure that we're getting those extra sanitizing steps done where we're hitting contact points at least once. Uh, and more often as we have the opportunity in those windows of time, that we're, uh, we've got uh, some extra attention to the sanitizing that happens around our, our lunchtime and that our, our restrooms are getting attention and, and an extra round of attention at least once a day. So between them adjusting and kind of strategically planning their day out and, and right down to the, during this period of time is when we're gonna hit this, this activity and then being able to pull in some of the, the transportation team to supplement that, I feel like we're in a good shape good. To, um, to tick all the boxes on our checklists uh, on a daily basis. Thank you. My one other project is laying behind me. That's Millie. <laughs> you guys got to meet her a little bit. Uh, I, I was uh, fortunate and blessed to uh, have Julie, or Millie join Julie and I at home as uh, part of the Sewell household, and we're her host home. And uh, she, uh, she brings a lot of joy to my day as we get her out and exercise her and and keep her commands rehearsed as, and we're looking uh, forward to seeing uh, what she does uh, to impact kids in our classrooms. Uh, big shout out to Kim Sperling and Chelsea Fountain who have really helped coordinate that effort and, uh, and, and get us everything we need to, to provide just top notch care for the dogs and, and, and position that program to be a great pilot for us. So that's been another uh, kind of sideline project for me, but one that's been a, a def definite uh, joy for me. So. What building is she going to go to? She is uh, a web spider, so she's Good looking for forward to uh, Angie Clendenning uh, and uh, Cole Zook, um, Peggy Kinsey, and, and the rest, uh, Sandra Haslan and Doug Adams are that uh, handling team in that building, and they, uh, we've had a, a, a couple of great team meetings where we've talked about what is, uh, what does it look like to integrate Millie into the daily routine at Web, and so we're we're excited to see what that looks like in the, in the coming weeks. So awesome. Hmm. Does Good. Millie want to do a couple activities? Will she give nucks? Maybe have Tina. She might. She might do some nucks. Does somebody want to? Somebody want to have Millie give nucks? Yeah, that's like Tina does. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But Mil Millie's uh, trained to visit a person by kind of putting her head on their lap in a comforting way. She's uh, trained to snuggle with them by kind of hopping her front paws up on her on your lap and, and kind of letting you love on her. Um, but she she I tell you I. I try to get her out in the community every single day, and so Julie and I walk in around the college and in the, in the various uh, trails around town and get her through downtown. Uh, we take her into Lowe's a lot, and I tell you, it brightens my day every time I get out because she brings so many smiles. Mm -hmm. um, just, just her, you know, she's a cute dog anyway, but she's friendly and she loves people. And uh, Hero, the other dog that uh, uh, Principal Corrick at Northwood uh, is hosting, um, both of the dogs are, I think, are going to just be a great uh, addition to our schools and uh, looking forward to seeing what they accomplish. Millie's so intuitive. Angie had her out the other day and she was having lunch with someone and the person got a little teary. Millie just walked around and sat right by him and without Angie saying anything. And then Millie came back over to Angie and something else came and she did it again. Yeah. Uh, and just that intuitive sense of my job is to help you feel better. Yep. And uh, it's just, it's, it's truly amazing. Yeah, she's seriously. still a puppy. She's chased Buttercup and a couple other. <laughs> <laughs> Leo and Rue, but she, she does a great job. And she, um, 
she's going to be a special addition to our school as well as Hero. I think I just thank the community for allowing this absolutely. part of the SEL process to take place. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for your time tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. All right, wrapping up uh, budget workshop. Yeah, it's not really fair that I have to follow Millie. <laughs> Do you need her back up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to go down here. Okay. Nope. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay. I, I don't feel like I have a loud voice, so um, feel free to chime in um, if I'm not talking loud enough or if you have any questions along the way. Dr. Clendenning has limited me to two hours for our budget <laughs> workshop tonight, <laughs> so turn the timer on. <laughs> so before we get started talking about the future, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things about our current financial status. We always keep a close eye on our rainy day fund. And in the last few months, we've kind of maintained our balance. Um, just a reminder, between December of 2018 and the year 2019, we spent about $350,000 on subsidizing transportation and another 653,000 on um, the environmental issues at Needham and Webb. So that caused the decrease in rainy day fund, but um, that's why you have a rainy day fund. So since then, we've been able to maintain um, that balance. Um, as a board, you, you approve transfers in and out of there to cover um, textbook reimbursement, but other than that, um, those transfers and a little bit of interest income has pretty much remained steady in the last few months. The next slide um, is just a reminder um, and to get this in front of you. Um, this is one of the financial indicators that the state tracks. Um, the general fund balance as a percentage of expenditure. This is something that we highlighted at the February board retreat and is also one of my least favorite metrics because of the fact that um, I feel like it's flawed. And as a reminder, in those years where you spend a lot on capital projects or geo bond funds, you're gonna have a lower percentage. So that caused the decrease um, for us in 2019. We we issued a um, geo bond in 2018 and expended quite a bit of that in 2019, which is why you see uh, the decrease to 23%. Um, so this will vary over the years, but as a board, I feel it's important for you to um, be updated on that and see since it's um, a part of the, the public view. Tina, does the state use that metric for anything? I'm sorry, the, does the state? Do they use this metric to make a decision or impact the school's funding at all? They, not yet. They just started tracking this data. I could see that maybe becoming an issue for future funding, but not as of today. Okay. And then some of the board goals that we talked about um, at our retreat this year, I just wanted to highlight where we are with those goals. Um, we always talk about increasing our operating balance in the education operations and referendum. It looks like we are on track to have an increase in our operating balance at the end of the year of about $200,000. $200, we also discussed maintaining an operating balance to cover at least two payrolls. We're definitely, we've achieved that and are on track to maintain that for the end of the the calendar year as well. And then we're always in the business of identifying savings and efficiencies. Um, some of those this year are our retirements. Once we um, pay out those retirements by the year 2021, we'll have a savings of $342,000.
And then we've had some COVID savings too. You hate to, um, you know, highlight something like this from a pandemic, but we have saved $322,000 in utilities, transportation, insurance, et cetera. I'm also proud of the fact that we've added virtual options for our students this year without adding any additional staffing. Thanks to um, Dr. Clendenning and, and Dr. Warland, um, they've really come up with some creative solutions without um, adding to the budget. And then we've also applied for um, a lot of grant funding. There's a lot of grant funding available for um, COVID-19. So we've got applications out there for um, almost $880,000 through FEMA, GEARS, and the CARES Act. So CARES Act we've gotten approved. We're still waiting for approval from GEARS. And we issued our first FEMA application, and it's in process of review. Um, and then we'll have a second application that's due at the end of August. So um, a lot of help out there. So hopefully we can recover some of those expenses that we've incurred and, um, you know, buying additional student desks, the um, uh, plexiglass that goes in between the... Uh, the, for the desk and the, the front office and everything. Um, we've got the sanitizers in there. We, we've thrown in everything we can. And in, in, um, in speaking with an advisor last week, they're encouraging us to, to throw in anything that's, anything that we've incurred that we wouldn't have incurred if it hadn't been for COVID. So this will be a good opportunity for us to recover a little bit. So looking forward to next year. So the first slide just shows um, what to expect over the next three months. Um, this is a very structured process that starts with this workshop. Um, I'll be requesting permission to advertise on August the 20th for our notice of the budget hearing that will occur on September 14th, which is the regular board meeting. That September 14th meeting is um, considered our public hearing on the 2021 budget. And we'll also request approval for our capital projects plan and our bus replacement plan at that meeting. And then at the October meeting, we'll turn around and um, request school board adoption of the 2021 budget. And then in November, we'll um, meet that deadline for entry of our budget into Gateway. The next slide is just a reminder of the four funds that we're dealing with. Um, the education fund is all funds associated with instruction in a classroom. The operations fund is um, administrative cost and costs associated with keeping our, our buildings open. Um, and it also includes transportation and capital projects. Our debt service is used for all payments um, of debt incurred by the corporation. And then the referendum fund houses the teacher's, um, teacher salary, support staff salary increases, managing class sizes, and our mental health initiatives. So this is our proposed 2021 budget, which is marked 2020. So that is a correction that needs to be made. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I've got some big changes to propose in the operations fund, but I'll start at the top. Um, in the education fund, we have um, built the budget based on flat enrollment, and flat enrollment will increase our revenue by about $450,000. We are obviously hoping for more than that, more students than that, but that's a conservative way to um, build the, the budget for next year. So we're requesting an increase in the education fund of about $802,000. This is going to include um, teacher salary increases, 
uh, new teacher positions. We've got health care um, premium increases in there. And then there, there's the offset of the retirement. And then the operations fund. So this is where the big change comes in. Um, so an ideal budget is revenue equals expenses, or maybe even revenue equals expenses and results in some savings, right? So I wish our budget was that simple, but we have the circuit breaker mixed in there. So in, in the past years, we have not considered circuit breaker in our budget request. Instead, we've accounted for it on the back end or the expense side and created miscellaneous expense accounts that nobody else had access to that, that accounted for that circuit breaker and allowed for that circuit breaker impact. Um, a different way of doing it is to factor that in on the front side and don't even ever count it in your revenue. So for us, um, just a reminder, we incur about $2 million of decrease in circuit breaker for debt service and about a million dollars in operations. So what I'm proposing to do is go ahead and account for that million dollar decrease in our operations fund request. That's why it looks so different. You're probably looking at that going, you're crazy because mm -hmm. you're only requesting $29,000 more. But that's why. So what, if the school board approves and agrees with this approach, what will happen is um, we've gone through and identified um, those miscellaneous 999 accounts to eliminate. That'll account for about half of that um, million dollar decrease. The other half um, have, has been distributed with budget cuts in those operating fund departments. Okay. They're not huge decreases. They're not anything that um, will have a huge impact on anyone. It's, you know, everybody shares in the wealth. And it will also kind of get us in into that budget cut mode that we're, we're facing for 2021. It's, it's coming. I think the governor is going to protect us for a short amount of time, but we need to start looking hard at um, where we can become more efficient. So I think this will set us up um, in a good way and and I'm not saying we've done this wrong in the past. I'm not saying that at all. And I, I may even try this and say, oh, we need to switch back. But for me, it's um, more of a comfort level of starting with exactly what we're gonna, gonna receive. And um, I feel like the financial statements that all of you look at quarterly will be more accurate because we're starting with um, the actual budget, if that makes sense. Um, I've also consulted with the Department um, of Labor and Government Finance and about this, and they're in agreement with that approach. Um, I reached out to a CFO that is um, in charge of a corporation that has very similar circuit breaker issues, and this is the way he handles it as well. So I've studied a lot. I feel pretty confident. Um, I've also spent a lot of time in the last year um, sitting down with principals and going over their budgets and designing reports that they're comfortable in looking at each month. So I think we're in a position where um, people will, will become accountable and, um, you know, they're already very conservative in their spending anyway. So I think we can handle this. If I might add one, one big difference that you're going to see, uh, when Mr. Mercer was going through the budget, you had to re ask permission to buy everything, right? A battery and all those different things. And this allows Tina to hand off and tell people, this is your budget. Don't exceed it. 
and allows her then to continue some other stuff. So it's a little just, just different approach, but I think it does provide a clear picture for everybody. Um, because you know that circuit breaker loss was always out there looming, right? And, and, and Jeff knew it, we knew it, yep. but it was always hard. Uh, so this allows that. So I appreciate that she's given the autonomy back to the building principals and saying, manage your budgets. And, and, and if you need help, contact her, she'll help. Well, I'll let the other board members talk, but we want you to own this. So if this is what you're comfortable with doing, and how you're gonna lead us into the budget, then I say, well done, Thank right? You. We may want to, if I go back and look at the schedule between now and October when we uh, adopt this budget, we may wanna schedule a work session if we can do like a virtual work session to, to give us more time to dive in with the, some of those questions mm -hmm. just to understand the, the changes there. Sure, we can do that. All right, any additional questions on that? Oh, and I, I should probably go through debt service too. Debt service has a minimum increase, um, maybe a little more interest. We did have a, a bond that will drop off at the end of this year, but we have another bond where the, the payment goes up, so it's kind of a wash. And then the referendum, um, we were pretty conservative with that increase. That just depends on, you know, we have that flat 23 cents. So any increase will depend on um, the increase in AV assessed value. Any other questions before I leave that slide? All right, and then the next slide just outlines where we're spending our money. As you can see, we're, we're spending 51% in the education fund, um, which is the most important fund. So um, we're focused on the right things. Our operations is about 19%, our debt service 24%, and our referendum is 6%. Here's the fun part, the tax rates. <laughs> So the first slide gives you a history of our assessed values. As, as you can see, from 2016 to 2019, we're cruising along at 3%. Everything is, is pretty steady. And then all of a sudden last year, we, we double and go to 6%. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I've had friends come up and say, boy, that referendum really increased my taxes a lot. Well, that's not really true because most of us hit the tax cap anyway. It, it was because of that assessed value increase of 6%. So um, we need to get that word out. It's estimated that we're gonna have another record-breaking year um, at almost 5% in 2021. That's what's posted now um, from what I understand they can go back in and make adjustments, so we can't really count on that until it's, it's over and called, but it looks like we're trending um, in that 5% direction, which is great news for us. So let's talk about the anomaly of what, what came into play last year. Our 2019-2020 debt service tax rate went from 99 cents in 2019, which is, is pretty close to what it had been the previous years before, and then w went down to 88 cents. So a lot of that was because of the um, huge increase in, in assessed value. That also subsequently increased our miscellaneous revenues, and then, probably a, a small contributor was the decrease in allowable operating balance that we can carry over. And what that relates to is our older bonds, we can carry 50% of the value of those, but as those drop off and we pay them off, we're limited to 15% on the newer bonds. So eventually um, the ability to carry over in that 
in the operating fund will diminish quite a bit. Now, um, Baker Tilly thinks that this tax rate will go back to 99 cents. And until today, and they, they sent me their last piece of evidence, um, I didn't believe them because, you know, we have about the same um, increase in assessed value. It, it, it seems like the same factors are going to play into 2021. Um, but what has finally clicked in my head is um, the fact that um, our operating balance is decreasing. We chose to start spending that down instead of to um, accommodate the circuit breaker instead of transferring operating funds to make our mortgage payment. So as we do that, it requires us to request more in levy to rebuild that balance. So that's why our debt service rate will naturally return to the 99 cent mark, which is what the taxpayers are used to, but they're calling 2020 the anomaly. So my last slide outlines our history of, um, of our advertised and approved tax rates. So if you look at the, the blue bar, that shows our advertised tax rates, which are always much higher than what is approved. Um, if you recall, we, we play this dance where um, we ask for the moon knowing that we're not going to get it. Um, but if we don't, they approve the lower of the adopted tax rate or the adopted levy. So if we don't shoot for the moon, then we won't end up getting that maximum levy that we're, um, we're eligible for. So, you know, it's pretty consistent from 2015 to 2019. We, we always ask for around $2. And then in 2020, it jumped to $2.21 because we added the referendum. And then our total proposed for this year is $2.29. So on the slide, I'm showing an estimated approved rate of $1.61. I'm going to change that um, bid to $1.71 because, as I said, Baker Tilly has convinced me that we're going to go back to the $0.99 cents for debt service. Um, and just to break it down, we're requesting 61 cents in operating. We always receive around 49 cents. Um, and then we're requesting 29 cents in referendum, again, to make sure we get that maximum levy, knowing that we're, we'll only get 23 cents. That's what the voters approved, so that's what we'll get. So... I think we'll land at about $1.71. And um, when we started down this path of referendum, we were at about $1.50 and then adding 23 cent referendum. So, you know, $1.73 was, was right where we were projected we would be. Can I answer any questions? Hopefully I explained that okay. The tax part's the complicated part, I know. Yeah, I, I wanna dig into this slide a little bit more, but I understand what you're saying. I just need to understand why in 2021 it's going up I'll follow up with you after. Okay. Okay. And we can add this to that work session. I yeah. just made a note yeah. to do that work to, to get with you to get the date for that work session. That's a really good idea. Those questions. Yeah. Okay, so what I need from you today is 
approval to advertise our notice to taxpayers, which up on the screen so everybody can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll move for approval. So this is what we're asking for. And again, those percentages of increase are because we're just attempting to maximize. We're being very conservative and assess value and requesting tax rates that we know we're not going to receive. All right. So Brian has made the motion for approval. Uh, any questions or comments? Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I vote yes, so that motion passes, Stan. And then Tina, you have the second one, uh, permission to advertise. Yes, so this has two attachments. Um, I'm requesting permission to advertise for our capital plan, um, which includes um, wireless access components at $50,000 and a firewall upgrade at $40,000. So we will advertise that between now and the budget hearing in September and ask for your approval at that meeting. All right, do I have a motion? I move for approval. Thank you, Becky. Any questions or comments? Brian, how do you vote? Yes. Christy? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I vote yes, motion passes, thank you. Now we move into uh, discussion topics, our traffic study. I'm sorry, I have one more resolution to, or um, notice to taxpayers for the um, bus replacement plan. So this will be outlining our plan to, um, to purchase and replace three buses in the 2021 school year. This is something that um, may not happen, but we'll go ahead and put it in the plan. Um, Later in the year, we'll decide where we are with our transportation costs, given the um, current um, workload on them and determine if we can afford the buses or if we need to hold off on that. But this will allow us to move forward with the approval anyway. Will those replacement buses all be outfitted with the uh, seat belts? Is that our plan moving forward? Jeff says yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, with that, then any questions, comments for Tina? Do I have a motion on the uh, notice for the buses? I'll move for approval. Thank you, Christy. Brian, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move into the uh, discussion area to the uh, traffic study. So as you uh, know, as you know, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the uh, car rider lines at several of our schools have been very challenging and we've uh, been able to make some improvements in that uh, through uh, different strategies and us using different driveways or, or painting uh, new traffic patterns on our, on our driveways. However, we are continuing to have some of those challenges and I, I've been uh, in consultation with Crossroads Engineering that specializes in that area of study. It's uh, the same company that's the design company for the uh, improvements to US 31 that will involve uh, the J turns and some of the other uh, improvements to 31 that are scheduled for a couple years from now. Uh, some of those improvements will affect our property at uh, the Franklin Community Middle School. And so this proposal, I, what I asked from Mr. Newport was for a proposal to study our traffic flow and, and make uh, suggestions for uh, our long range planning in terms of what uh, driveways alignments uh, would work for us 
at uh, the middle school, Northwood, Custer Baker, and uh, Creekside. So this, um, this project uh, would entail uh, doing studies and uh, pr preparing a report with a series of recommendations for us. It would also uh, help us maximize our opportunity with the US 31 project to make some improvements to the Franklin Community Middle School. As you can hear, we have some severe weather coming through, 70 mile an hour winds, uh, severe thunderstorms, so uh, it is, oh. yeah, it's, that's what you're hearing. Wow. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that uh, ra radar, but uh, no, no tornado signals at this time, but yeah, it is, it is raining and blowing very hard. Sure, where we're at with the agenda, we could uh, we could pause from the big. Uh, so, so with, th with that, uh, I can bring that. Uh, if you'd like to uh, consider that, I'll bring that back as an action item next month. Absolutely. Were there any questions? Um, did you did you need this approved today? Did you need this approved today? Uh, if if it were approved today, I could ask Mr. Newport to begin his analysis, starting with the chaos that will rain down upon us on Monday. <laughs> okay. No, the, the, uh, no we, we, we're expecting heavy uh, car rider lines on Monday because okay. we've asked the community to help mm -hmm. us with that. We're gonna need their patience uh, with that. We have, uh, I, I'm having some, some new traffic uh, markings uh, uh, painted at uh, the middle school as kind of an interim measure. Uh, we had some uh, painted yesterday at Northwood it's going to add uh, the ability for us to store more cars on our property rather than stretching out into roadways and blocking intersections. Uh, I would like to get Mr. Newport started looking uh, at and observing what happens when we have those heavy traffic flows. Uh, if you were so inclined to, to promote it to an action item, that would, that would, that would okay. be helpful. Then, then I'll make a motion to make this an action item. All right. With the motion to move it to an action item, uh, Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Brian? Yes. Okay, so we'll move it to an action item. Now do I have a uh, motion? Make first? a motion to approve. Thank you, Brian. Christy? Yes. Becky? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I vote yes, so motion passes. Great. You can engage. We'll, we'll get to work on that. Yep. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, now we'll move into the uh, board comment section. Oh, I uh, joined David on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee meeting last week, and I thought that was just such a blessing, uh, super exciting stuff coming our way. So just kudos to everyone who's been involved in that effort. It's long overdue, um, but, but really, really exciting. I'm sorry, Ryan, what committee? <laughs> With the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Okay, oh. thank you. And we meet next on August the 26th. Uh, during that time, we're hoping then to post the job description. We did finish that. I included that in Friday notes for everybody to look at. But uh, yeah, we're looking, we're looking forward to continuing moving those steps. Um, I did reach out to Tippy Canoe Schools up in Lafayette. They just hired their diversity and inclusion uh, person. I spoke to her. She actually lived in our area. She worked at Atterbury for many years before she moved up there. So she was very familiar, and she did say she would be more than happy to help us. And anything we can do so we're looking forward to that I do have one other thing uh, mrs. gross could you go to our website and pull up the reopening plan yeah. I just want to give a the kudos to uh, four people who really put in a lot of hours and effort but one that did most of the work I think and that is uh, mrs. Betts our communications specialist um, we put together a, a, a reopening plan with all of the information instead of in different pieces and parts we now have it uh, as one document uh, it should be This is the document that we just put together, and if you could just kind of scroll through there, but I wanted to highlight that to every parent, as well as to the school board. This, put, this puts everything together, what we're going to be doing to begin the journey next Monday. 
Um, we did take information from our plans, but we've also highlighted the benchmarking dates, the calendar dates, the schedules, what it looks like for social emotional learning and all things. So I wanna thank Mrs. Betts, Mr. Ahouse, Mrs. Holman, who uh, worked with Dr. Worland as well to create this document. So it's just a, another example of a great resource that we're gonna have for parents. Yeah, I looked through that earlier today. It was very thorough and it was, thank you Robin for all your hard work, mm -hmm. it was good. Dr. Clendenning, any other uh, comments? We are just scheduled to be here next Monday, starting back in school with our hybrid model, model grades 7 to 12 and K to 6 in person. Um, we are monitoring a few classes. Uh, one of them is actually the virtual classes are continuing to see parents uh, choose that option, and Dr. Warland has really taken the lead on that. Do you want to mention anything about what's happening in the virtual world? Yes, uh, very quickly, just to remind families uh, that we are using our Apex Virtual Learning Platform 7 through 12. I've had that question a couple of times uh, today and last week, and we are uh, having, having those opportunities with students facilitated by Franklin Community Schools teachers in support. K through 6 is with our own uh, teachers with some uh, support through our instructional coaching team as well. Our numbers do continue to grow. We have, we're approaching we have 11.7% of the student body right now in the virtual space, and I've uh, gotten a couple of emails just this afternoon uh, since I signed off. So we will continue to monitor those numbers. The deadline is September 11th, so we will look at where we are in that space and in our classroom spaces throughout the next four weeks. And the, all the other classes we're continuing to monitor, Creekside is quite full. Um, even with uh, the 11% going to virtual, uh, we are seeing our second highest kindergarten class ever at that school. Um, all combined, it's 131 students. The largest was 144. Um, and then if we look just across the, the district, we're seeing that trend. Um, the neighborhoods are filling up. Uh, the, homes at Young, uh, the homes of Young's Creek, whatever, yeah, uh, the new Windstar. What, the new Windstar. <laughs> um, I, I rode my bike there yesterday. They have um, several homes that are finished and all the lots are sold in phase one. They are going to the technical review for phase three this week. So we are seeing a lot of homes. Heritage also has a, all the homes on the south, the new south end, completed with families moving in there. And then the uh, um, Clover Trail, Clover Trace, um, those homes are also populated. So in a non-COVID year, I would anticipate our numbers would be up. Um, but right now with that virtual and some of those things, we're seeing some things that will keep us looking very similar to last year. Um, also, and lastly, I am monitoring uh, classes at CBIS. Right now we are sitting and about 25 uh, in a class in grade five and about 22 in grade six. So grade six is actually looking quite well for us. And so Mrs. Moran and I spoke this afternoon and we are monitoring that because she's also getting some kids to move in. And it seems like the move-ins are coming in in fifth grade. So that's an area we did look that if we do need to add, it would go to the back side of the building over by those two health classes. So it would be away from everybody but the way that we're gonna do school, it really doesn't matter because they're gonna be a self-contained pod anyway. So that's what we're looking at and we'll keep you posted through Friday notes as we head to the 17th. Okay, Mrs. Betts, have you received any questions or comments? All right, thank you. Any comments from the board? Okay, with that, then I will adjourn the meeting. Thanks for your time.